Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, boy, it's really nice to see um, some of my colleagues from cardiothoracic surgery and thoracic surgery and uh, some of our foundation board leadership. Dick, uh, I think I saw Mahendra walk in too, so nice to see you all this afternoon to celebrate this really, really important event. So my name is John Lynch. I'm the president of Barnes Jewish Hospital, and I've actually had the pleasure of working with many of the colleagues here for over 30 years, um, but um, it's been a great time and uh, really admire their work. Um, but today, on behalf of the Foundation for Barnes Jewish Hospital, I'm pleased to welcome you to the installation of Dr. Shioshi Kaneko to the John M. Schoenberg Chair in Cardiovascular Disease. So that's what we're here for today. It's an honor to share this special occasion with colleagues, faculty, donors who are here today representing uh, John Schoenberg. Uh, and especially with Dr. Kaneko and his family who's here. I think I saw his wife and his son. Welcome. Um, and of course, the Schoenberg family. In addition to enhancing Dr. Kaneko's role as Chief of Cardiac Surgery at Washington University School of Medicine at Barnes Jewish Hospital, endowed chairs represent generous donor support for the hospital's mission of teaching, research, clinical care, and community service. These endowed chairs recognize a career of academic and clinical excellence that are among the highest honors that physicians and scientists can receive. Um, being named a chair, however, is not the end of the professional journey, right? Um, and I've heard David say this. Uh, an endowed chair also represents hope for the future as they fuel groundbreaking research, discoveries, and innovation. They have the potential to shape patient care for decades to come at our academic medical center throughout the U.S. and around the world. That's why we have Dr. Kaneko today as the world as a ideal leader and visionary to honor. This chair was established in 1984 through the generosity and foresight of the Schoenberg family. And I think Ralph, you're going to have some reflections, I believe, on the history of the chairs. So looking forward to those. Over the past 39 years, it has been held by several esteemed, internationally recognized pioneer physicians who have left an indelible mark on the field of cardiac surgery. The John M. Schoenberg Chair in Cardiovascular Disease stems from a long tradition of community leadership and philanthropy by the Schoenberg family and the Schoenberg Foundation. The Schoenbergs were instrumental in the success of the former Jewish hospital and continue their generous support of healthcare in our community through the Foundation for Barnes Jewish Hospital. John M. Schoenberg was president of the Jewish Hospital from 1958 to 1963 and a long time an active board member. Unfortunately, he was only 59 years old when he died of a sudden heart attack, which of course motivated the family to establish this endowed chair in cardiovascular disease. The Schoenberg families generosity over generations has made so much possible on this medical campus and beyond. We're grateful for the visionary donors like the Schoenbergs who continue to fuel discoveries and improve patient care through physician leaders and pioneers like Dr. Kaneko. The Schoenberg family has a few representatives here today. So I see Cindy, his daughter, and her husband, Sandy. Thanks for coming, Sandy Peters, and their children. I, I met Turner. Uh, Turner, thanks for coming and joining us today. Um, so at this time, would you all come up and accept the token of our gratitude for your uh, generous support of the Schoenberg family chair? Got a little... And now let's kick off this celebration and enjoy some heartfelt well wishes and special sentiments for Dr. Kaneko with this video. Congratulations to my good friend, Dr. Yoshi Kaneko, for his very well-deserved Schoenberg Chair in Cardiovascular Disease. My name is Tom Wayne. I'm the Chief of Cardiovascular Surgery at UCSF. 
and I've known Yoshi for nearly 10 years. Dr. Conecuh has been a pioneer in our field and is a true quadruple threat with respect to patient care, teaching, research, and service. I have a lot of great memories with Dr. Conecuh, but perhaps the most memorable is working with him on different committees and research projects. Dr. Conecuh has always unselfishly support our trainees and residents, pushing them to be the primary author or presenter at our major academic meetings, and probably more importantly, pushing them to be the absolute best that they can be beyond their even wildest imaginations. He always thinks of others first and has become a role model for our community. Congratulations again, Yoshi. Enjoy your special day when you deservingly get to be in the spotlight. Cheers. Hello, I'm Dr. Patrick O'Gara, the Watkins Family Distinguished Chair in Cardiology at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. It is my distinct pleasure to have this opportunity to say a few words about my friend and colleague, Dr. Yoshi Kaniko, who has recently left the Brigham to become the John M. Schoenberg Endowed Chair in Cardiovascular Diseases at Barnes Jewish Hospital and Washington University in St. Louis. We are extremely proud of Yoshi's continued upward trajectory as one of the finest academic cardiac surgeons in the United States. We were pleased that Dr. Kaneko joined us way back in 2011, 11 and a half years ago, as a resident in cardiothoracic surgery. He then went on to become the chief resident in cardiothoracic surgery and did postgraduate work in aortic diseases as well as endovascular techniques. Dr. Kaneko uh, then became one of the foundational members of our structural heart disease program and in a very short period of time became the surgical director of structural heart disease in addition to the surgical director of our aortic disease program. Within a reasonably short period of time, in addition to all of that, he started a clinical outcomes research program within the Division of Cardiac Surgery that over a 10 year period of time became highly productive and highly successful. Dr. Kaniko over this short period of time has been recognized both locally as well as nationally and internationally for his academic acumen uh, and for his productivity. Let me share with you some of the highlights of his um, academic career. They include being selected from an extremely competitive group of individuals to join the emerging faculty program at the American College of Cardiology. And as a cardiologist, it's extremely important for me to be able to highlight the degree to which Dr. Kaneko has worked seamlessly with cardiologists over his career. Dr. Kaneko was named the Maxwell Chamberlain winner of the award for the best presentation at the Society of Thoracic Surgeons in 2019. He also then went on to win the C. Walton Lillehigh Award for the best presentation by a senior author at the American Association of Thoracic Surgery that same calendar year. I think these exemplify the degree to which he is recognized by his peers for the superior nature of his research. Let's face it, we were very sad that Yoshi was lured to St. Louis uh, to uh, this wonderful position and the opportunity that you have provided for him. I have every expectation that he will continue to thrive, that he will build a very successful program, uh, and that you will share in the excitement and the admiration that we continue to have regarding this highly talented individual. I wish him all of the best of luck. I plan to continue to collaborate with him and look forward to following his career with keen interest. Thank you for this opportunity. Good afternoon. My name is John Potts. I wish I could be there in person with you today, but as you see, I'm uh, in Chicago. I had the privilege of recruiting Yoshi to the General Surgery Residency Program at the University of Texas Houston Medical School and watching him develop as a General Surgery Resident. Of course, we've followed his career with pride and with interest over the past decade. I want to congratulate Washington University for recruiting Yoshi as the Sonberg Chair of Cardiovascular Disease. He is a gentleman, a scholar, 
a remarkably talented surgeon and as you will soon know he's just a nice guy you could not have recruited a better person for this job yoshi all the best to you and your beautiful bride from annie and me and congratulations once again yoshi i hope you enjoyed those comments from your colleagues and mentors at this point i'd like to turn over the program to dr david perlmutter executive vice chancellor for medical affairs and dean at washington university thanks john i'm honored to represent the Washington University School of Medicine on this support, important occasion. We were so thrilled to be able to recruit Yoshi as our new chief of cardiac surgery last year, and now to be able to recognize his accomplishments with the Schoenberg professorship. We're so pleased that you are now part of the Wash U Medicine and Barnes Jewish Hospital family. BJH has long been home to incredibly impactful leaders of academic medicine from WashU, and in particular, world leaders in surgical subspecialties. Some of the most important innovations in cardiac and thoracic surgery have happened in the halls and operating rooms of BJH over many decades. Dr. Kaneko's work on new innovations to improve the outcomes of surgery for complex valvular heart disease fits beautifully within the tradition of leadership established here as far back as the 1930s and 1940s. The John M. Schoenberg Chair in Cardiovascular Diseases not only represents the excellence of what you have accomplished in your career to date and how you have focused on improving the quality of life for countless patients with cardiac disease, but also the expectation that you will go beyond over the coming years to impact patients in need here in St. Louis, in our region, and around the world. Over the next decade, we anticipate many new technologies, cellular reprogramming and gene therapies that have the potential to change the regenerative potential of the heart that can be brought to bear on improving on those things that you have already done and resulting in even better outcomes for cardiac patients. And we are confident that your leadership will put us, WashU and BJC, at the very forefront of that revolution. Dr. Kaneko, on behalf of Washington University and its distinguished faculty, Please know how much we are, we admire the work that you are doing and will do here at BJH. And please accept our most heartfelt congratulations as you are officially installed in this historic professorship. And now to continue uh, the ceremony, please welcome Dr. John Olson, head of the Department of Surgery and the William K. Bixby Professor of Washington University School of Medicine. John. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, what a fantastic occasion, and congratulations, Yoshi, for a uh, uh, job well done so far and an even brighter future. Uh, I'd like to take a special moment to thank John Schumberg's family on behalf of the Department of Surgery for your family's generosity. It's through these types of gifts that we're able to do the great work that we do, both uh, clinically and academically. I'd also like to thank Maiko and Masa, uh, Yoshi's family, uh, for sharing your husband with us. Uh, he'll spend many hours with us, and I apologize in advance for his dedication to his work. Um, you know, we, uh, after a, a national search, uh, congratulations, Tim and Ralph, uh, we were fortunate indeed to recruit Dr. Kaneko from Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. As you heard, he rapidly rose uh, there 
uh, as surgical director of the Structural Heart Program, director of aortic and endovascular surgery, and director of clinical outcomes in the division of cardiac surgery. Yoshi has had a meteoric career, to say the least. He is a clinically superb surgeon, and that uh, all of this was built on a foundation of an incredible educational pedigree. Um, uh, Yoshi uh, grew up in, in Japan, and he took his medical degree from Kayo uh, University School of Medicine. Then he completed uh, general surgery and cardiothoracic uh, training there and could have stayed to become a, a well-known professor there. But that wasn't enough. He came to the United States and repeated the exercise here in the United States, taking his general surgery residency at UT Houston, as we heard, and his cardiothoracic surgical training at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, not only did he complete general, uh, thoracic, uh, or cardiothoracic training there, he did specialized training in endovascular surgery, and then even went on to complete an aortic surgery fellowship at the Duke University. Dr. Kine uh, Kineko's clinical expertise combines both open uh, surgical, minimally invasive, and endovascular approaches to complex cardiac disease. He and his trainees will be the future of cardiac surgery. Uh, as evidenced at the Brigham, he led the largest structural heart program in New England and advanced the care nationally by developing innovative and courageous approaches to the endovascular treatment of aortic and valvular heart disease. Truly a pioneer. Dr. Kaneko, uh, in addition, was a, is an outstanding researcher. His primary research interest, again, is aligned with his clinical practice on aortic and valvular heart disease. He has served as principal investigator for over 10 clinical trials and has published over 90 peer-reviewed articles describing these results. He's spoken nationally and internationally on these topics and has become a respected international authority. Uh, it is very clear that, Yoshi, you have impacted cardiac surgery now and for the future. Very relevant to our key mission here at Washington University of educating the next generation of surgeons. Uh, Yoshi has uh, really demonstrated a commitment to the uh, future, to developing future leaders in cardiothoracic surgery. He was the program director for Advanced Cardiac Surgery Fellowship and the Endovascular Cardiac Surgery Fellowship at the Brigham, as well as being the associate director for the overall cardiothoracic surgery residency program. Importantly to our trainees, Dr. Kaneko was selected by the surgical residents for his teaching excellence, receiving the John J. Collins Teaching Award in 2017. As you can see, Dr. Kaneko has proven himself as a world leader in cardio, cardiothoracic surgery. His clinical skills in complex vascular or valvular heart disease, his commitment to patient outcomes, and his dedication to training future cardiothoracic surgeons. These things resonate with what we do here at WashU, and we're looking very forward to his contributions. Yoshi shared with me his vision to create an innovative culture accomplished with quality and a destination clinical program that will also foster diversity and health equity to create experts in our subspecialty and further invest in the education and development of our next generation. It is clear with the support of our department the Division of Cardiothoracic Surgery and the Prof Schoenberg Professorship, Dr. Kaneko's future is indeed bright, as is our all. So again, thank you very much to the Schoenberg family, to Yoshi's family, and I uh, look forward to um, your future here with us, Yoshi. I'd like to turn things over now to Ralph Damiano, our Cardiothoracic Division Chief. Well, thank you, Dr. Olson, and, and good afternoon to everyone, and welcome to this wonderful event. Um, and I would also like to start by thanking the Schoenberg family and their generosity and also the foundation for their support of our academic mission over the years and really can't emphasize how critical philanthropy is, enable us to stay at the forefront of where cardiothoracic surgery not only is, but where it will be in the next decade. I thought I'd start first by uh, recognizing a couple people. Um, first, and I don't see him here, but I think we need to recognize him, and that's uh, Dr. Kachukas, and I'm hoping he'll be uh, here this evening. He, he's having some, um, some minor issues that I think have prevented him from coming, but Dr. Kachukas was the emeritus 
an inaugural, he's the President Emeritus Schoenberg Chair and was the inaugural Schoenberg Chair. And I think he set an extremely high bar for those who have followed. But I think Dr. Kaneko lives up to that bar. And similar to Dr. Kachukas, he's a master cardiac surgeon and I think one of the leading surgeons of his generation. So I think I would like to recognize Dick and hopefully he'll be able to join us this evening. Uh, finally, I'd like to recognize before I start a really special guest, Dr. Randy Chitwood. And for most of cardiac surgeons, he no, needs no introduction, but for um, those of you, he really um, has many, many outstanding achievements. Um, first of all, he, when he finished his fellowship, he became immediately prof full professor and chief of the division of cardiothoracic surgery at ECU. He went on to become chair of the department there and also executive associate vice chancellor for health sciences. And I think they used to call their cardiovascular institute the Chitwood Institute, or they may probably will be renaming it if it hasn't already been. But Dr. Chitwood, on top of all that, has been a real uh, pioneer and one of the leading uh, figures over the last uh, 20 to 30 years in minimally invasive cardiac surgery and robotic cardiac surgery. Very uh, pertinent to this, this afternoon and evening celebration. Dr. Shit has been a mentor both to me. Um, he finished Duke uh, five years ahead of me and taught me a lot of my, in my initial years as a, a fellow there, uh, both how to be a surgeon and, and how to be an academic, successful academic surgeon but also was able to mentor Dr. Kaneko in robotics. And uh, I would have to say it was Dr. Chitwood's phone call to me one day that really put, uh, Yoshi was very close to the top of the list, but uh, you know, he, he, he uh, quickly uh, cemented his position there um, and very gave very, very high recommendations for Dr. Kaneko. You know, and just as I start these remarks, it does bring back many memories 23 years ago. Um, I was recruited here to the same position and also named Schoenberg Chair. Um, it seems like a long time ago. I'm very happy to welcome Dal Yoshi uh, into that chair. Um, but it also reminds me of the national search, and we did have an extensive national search uh, that I had the fortune to lead. And when it started, I thought of what, what was really expected of someone to lead cardiac surgery here for the next 10 years. And it thought of the sort of unique characteristics and challenges of leading academic surgery divisions in 2023. First of all, we're expected to be very innovative, but absolutely no one will tolerate any type of failure, um, which many of you know is many consider the first step of innovation, but cardiac surgical innovation is challenging because really failure is not something that we can accept because it ends up usually in poor patient outcomes. Finally, we expect people can lead change and force people out of their comfort zone and often do things that they would rather not do, but at the same time not to offend anyone and also to achieve as much of unanimous consensus on any change as you can. And finally, as Yoshi's found, uh, you take full personal responsibility for all the negative outcomes, but we really expect you to share all the positive outcomes with all the team and with all, um, with all your colleagues. And it really requires a unique individual. And I think it requires someone who has confidence without arrogance. It requires someone who's goal-driven, but not goal-obsessed. It requires someone to be a courageous risk-taker but at the same time to be conservative because our first and most important responsibility is to our patients. And finally, we need someone who's very ambitious, but you have to be ambitiously outward looking, not inward looking. And I'm happy to say as I start these comments that I can't think of anyone more well suited to that tremendous challenge than Dr. Kaneko. So he was our first choice and I am absolutely proud to be up here today to introduce him. He's already, as you've heard, widely acknowledged expertise in transcatheter therapeutics, aortic surgery, as well as minimally invasive cardiac and robotic surgery, and we're planning on starting that program um, in, the next, in the next year. And uh, Dr. Kaneko has won a very prestigious robotic fellowship from the AETS to bring that expertise um, to Washington University. 
But these are very important emerging fields in our, um, in our specialty, and he brings, as you've heard, world-class expertise to our program. Um, I, he has had a tremendous impact already in his relatively young career in developing and disseminating numerous advanced surgical techniques in our specialty, and his record has been truly outstanding, as you've heard from a number of the other speakers. He's helped to develop and implement a number of new surgical techniques and uh, certainly been instrumental in teaching those to a broader audience in both uh, minimally invasive and endovascular surgery, and particularly trying to prevent complications during transcatheter uh, valve replacement. At the Brigham, he also started the first transaxillary ascending aortic stent grafting program in New, New, Z New England and introduced these new devices to decrease incidence of stroke following transcatheter aortic valve res replacement. He also established one of the first uh, enhanced recovery after surgery programs um, at the Brigham, and this really led to a number of advances in the quality of care at that institution. As, in, as importantly, as Dr. Olson mentioned, he also is a great teacher and has won teaching awards, uh, not only from his trainees, but he's also been actively teaching surgeons around the world on these new techniques. As a global leader already in our field of cardiac surgery, Dr. Kaneko has been and continues to be very committed to training future leaders, not only here, but around the globe. He served as program director for both the Advanced Cardiac Surgery Fellowship and the Endovascular Cardiac Surgery Fellowship at the Brigham, and was also associate program director of the residency programs. And his trainees have spoke very highly of him. As you, you heard, he's won a number of teaching awards. And for these many reasons, I am extremely excited to welcome Dr. Kaneko to Washington University and Barnes Jewish Hospital and to have him as a colleague in our group. His outstanding clinical research and leadership skills, I think will build on our legacy going back um, now over almost getting close to 100 years now as one of the top academic uh, divisions of cardiothoracic surgery um, in the world. So I'd like to very much add to everyone else's my congratulations, Yoshi, on this well-deserved appointment. Um, he's been an absolute uh, pleasure to have as a colleague since he joined us. And as Dr. Potts said, on top of all this, he is really an absolutely wonderful person. So it's now my privilege to introduce Dr. Yoshi Kaneko and initiate his installation as the John Schoenberg Chair in Cardiovascular Disease at the Barnes Jewish Foundation. Dr. Lynch. John, David. So uh, after the enthusiastic uh, recommendation by Dr. Perlmutter and Dr. Olson, and on behalf of the physicians, staff, and trustees of Barnes Jewish Hospital, and the Foundation for Barnes Jewish Hospital. I hereby install Dr. Yoshi Kaneko as the John M. Schoenberg Chair in Cardiovascular Disease. First of all, I would like to thank everyone who's here uh, for attending this, uh, this event, and I truly welcome um, and you know, thank you so much for, uh, for spending your time today. And of course, I would like to thank the, uh, the Schoenberg family for your, for your generosity and the foundation um, to really get this honorable position for my future. Um, it is a true honor to follow the giants of the field like Dr. Kachukis, Dr. Damiano, and my predecessor, Dr. Moon, 
and it is truly a privilege. Um, I really want to thank Dr. Damione and Dr. Eberlein for picking me um, to this position, and Dr. Olson for the current and the future um, mentorship. Um, I would like to thank all the mentors and friends that has commented, and specifically Dr. Chitwood from coming to coming to this ceremony from North Carolina. Um, I know you took a very early flight today, so thank you so much. And I thought about what I should talk about today. And when you think about a cardiac surgeon, you would think about this alpha male, a dictator in the operating room, right? But um, as a matter of fact, we can't do a surgery without a team at all. If you don't have a perfusionist, we can't do surgery. As a matter of fact, if I don't have a first assist RN, I can't even do a cabbage. So the teamwork is crucial in cardiac surgery. And there's this new concept of heart team over the past decade. And I thought that it'll be a very, very good topic to talk about today, the past and the future of the heart team. So one of the facts that you probably don't know about me is I love history. Um, I usually listen to history videos during workout in the morning. And I thought I would start, start off with some history slide. So the Treaty of Westphalia, is a treaty that ended the 30-year war. And the significance of this is that it created this sovereignty called the Westphalian sovereignty, which means that each state has exclusive sovereignty over its territory. Before this, you had kings. You know, you sort of follow the kings and stuff like that, but not always. It didn't happen all the time. But after this, things changed. And of course, after the French Revolution, it's a birth of uh, democracy, but it also created this concept of nation state, which means that the political unit where nation and state are congruent, meaning that we're French, we're gonna fight for France. That's where it started. And this really led to this concept of nation state. When you watch the Olympics, you root for Simone Bile or Kevin Durant and chant USA when you're watching this. So this is where it all first started. Bear with me, we're gonna go somewhere with this. Um, <laughs> Halari is probably the best philosophy, philosophist over the past decade, and most of you have probably read this book. Um, he says that the most significant revolution that the human beings had, who dominated the world, was this revolution called the Cognitive Revolution. And we were able to create this thing called Imagined Orders. So when we saw a mountain, we say that a god lives there, and we're going to unite. That's how we became a team. So when we see a tree, we can look at it and say, this is money. When you see a car, you can look at it and say, this is Tesla or Kia. When you look at a land, you can call it a USA. When you look at a building, you call it BJH. No particular meaning to this, Dr. Lynch, okay. And when you see homo sapiens, you call them cardiac surgeons, cardiologists, or nurses. So these are all imagined orders. So now the meat of the talk. So my expertise, the transcatheter aortic valve replacement, it is a really, really creative valve where you mount a pericardial valve on a frame stent, a metal stent, and you implant it under x-ray. So you really don't need to open the chest. This was revolutional. And this was the first in man taver that was performed in the world in April 16th of 2002. This was performed in France by a interventional cardiologist called Dr. Alan Cribier. And this is the picture, 15 minutes after the procedure, you can see that the patient's alive. He was a very young patient, but also very sick, too sick to get anything. And this was the result. And nowadays we can do this tavern procedure through just a needle stick. I don't know if I can play this video um, in any ways. Click it again. I don't think it, okay, there we go. So you can just do these procedures through a needle stick rather than opening the chest, which is the traditional open heart surgery. This is cutting out a valve. And you can see, this was supposed to be a minimally invasive uh, surgery through an upper hemisternotomy. You can see the invasiveness of the surgery compared to the TAVR procedure. So the TAVR really, really took on. So as I mentioned in the first slide, the first TAVR was performed in 2002. Subsequently, there were multiple, multiple randomized control study that was being performed. In 2011, it first got approval in prohibitive risk patients. These were patients too sick to get an operation. In 2012 and 2014, there were two valves that were approved for high-risk patients. In 2016 and 2017, for intermediate-risk patients. And then subsequently, in 2019, 
in low-risk patients. So now the TAVR covers all risk patients. You can perform it basically on anyone. So back in 2012, when the Medicare approved this procedure, they have this um, documentation called NCD, National Coverage Decision, and they made a statement, and which was actually um, lobbied by a lot of the surgeons and the cardiologists, but it said that the patient has to be under the care of a heart team. And the heart team's interventional cardiologist and cardiac surgeon must jointly perform the procedure, and the heart, the heart team should include a cardiac surgeon, interventional cardiologists, and other groups such as APPs, nurses, research personnel, and administrators. This was in the documentation. And we all know that these multidisciplinary teams work. There's a lot of general surgeons and um, oncologists. There's a lot of papers in oncology about multidisciplinary team. There's a lot of papers in urology, OBGYN. There's even a paper about talking about a medical team training program in surgical mortality published, published in JAMA. So there's been a lots of benefit of this multidisciplinary team that has been published in other fields of medicine. So how about the heart team? So the first heart team concept came out of this paper in 2009. This is actually a very famous trial called the Syntax trial, comparing the stent, which goes through the legs and opens up the vessel when they have heart attacks, or the traditional bypass surgery, and when they created this clinical trial, the selection of patients were done by both the interventional cardiologist and cardiac surgeon. This was sort of the birth of the heart team, and this actually made it to the guidelines a year after. So in 2010, in the European guidelines, they recommended an evaluation by the heart team. And also in the US guidelines in 2011, there was a heart team approach recommendation that was, that was in there. So one of the research questions that I had was, does the heart team really work? That was my first question. And this was the, um, the Chamberlain paper that, that I think Dr. Olson and Dr., um, Dr. Damiano has mentioned, which was presented in 2019. So what this really looked at is this concept called volume outcome relationship. It sounds very, very fancy, but all it means is that the more you do, you get better. So to the left is the volume outcome relationship of TAVR, and then to the right, which I was involved in this project, is looking at the volume outcome relationship of surgery. So both of them, they say that the more TAVRs you do, the outcome gets better. The more surgeries you do, the outcomes gets better. So our question, we wanted to frame this in a heart team, and what we really wanted to do, we looked at the Medicare claims, and we divided these into hospitals based on their surgical aortic valve replacement volumes. So the low volume was 10 to 99 patients. Group two was 100 to 199 patients. Group three was 200 to 299. And group four was the highest volume group. And when we compare the outcome, we adjusted with everything, the hospital volume, the locations, the patient population, we adjusted with everything. And what we found was that if you have a high volume in surgery, the TAVR outcomes became better. So the lower you go, the worse the outcomes got. And this was something that we reported. So the high surgical volume was leading to better TAVR outcomes, meaning that if you have a high volume heart team, then the TAVR outcomes became better. So that was one of the findings that we saw. So what is the benefit of the heart team? It's the options of surgery and transcatheter discussed at the same meeting. We do this every week. And then you get input from multiple specialists. You have specialists in the room that can actually discuss these cases. And you will have more effective communication because you're working as a team. And it expedites referral. They just have to refer it to the heart team. And then it avoids turf war and patient-centered care. So there's, there's a phenomenon called diversity paradox. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of this. Um, this is actually a psychosocial social paper uh, published in 2009. It was done at Northwestern. Very interesting study, not really medicine, but um, they had 54 person groups with same gender and they solved the murder case by reading a report by detective. It's actually a very, very interesting concept. But uh, what they did was the fourth member of the group was either from the same fraternity or different group. So they call it an in-group and an out-group. They even created a second group which had two out-group members and the outcomes were quite striking. So if you have more members that were out-group, so contrary to what we believe, if you have more people from the out-group, the, the correction rate went up, meaning that if you have a diverse group, it actually outperforms the homo homogenous group, 
meaning that the diversity actually increases the power of your team. So going back to TAVR, um, I, I, I had this um, TVT registry, which is the joint organization between ACC and STS, their research and publication committees. And this is one of the slides that we create. So how many TAVR sites are there in the United States currently? There's 816 sites. We started off with less than 100 sites. Now we have over 816. And this slide needs a little bit of explanation, um, but I want you to focus on the blue line, which is the total number of aortic valve surgeries being performed in the United States. You can see that around 2017, it started to decrease. And now you can see the clear increasing line in orange, which is TAVR being performed much, much more frequently than the surgical aortic valve replacement. So when you see this, you would think that, oh, you know, the field of TAVR is pretty much set, but not really. So why is the heart team so important? One of the things that we have to pay attention to the details, the devil's in the details, and there is a condition called bicuspid aortic valves. A lot of the heart surgeons know this, but about 2% of the population has it, and it's hereditary. It even made in the sketch of Leonardo da Vinci um, back in the 15th centuries. So to the left is a normal, uh, normal aortic valve, which has three leaflets. In the middle is a bicuspid aortic valve, which only has two leaflets. In the CAT scan, it looks like this, and in reality, it looks like this. So if you think about putting that circular valve inside of this fish mouth opening, you would think that there might be some problem with this. And there was some concern about putting a TAVR valve in, the, um, in these bicuspid aortic valves. So multiple randomized control studies were being performed, as I mentioned in the beginning, for this TAVR and SAVR uh, RCTs, and almost all of them excluded bicuspid aortic valves. These were not really studied in these, um, in these papers. So what do we do? We looked at it. Uh, we looked at the TAVR outcomes in bicuspid aortic valves, um, comparing to the three leaflet valves. We used a registry, um, and we excluded some patients, came up with around 2,000 patients, and we did propensity matching. And we showed that uh, one-year mortality or stroke was about the same, meaning that you can actually do TAVRs in these bicuspid aortic valves. However, there was a little more caveat to this. On the follow-up paper, uh, we looked at a little more carefully on the anatomy of these, um, of these bicuspid aortic valves. If you have anatomy that looks like to the right, then those patients died faster. So you shouldn't be doing TAVRs in these patients. And we also looked at um, surgical aortic valve replacements and bicuspid aortic valves using the registry. And almost unanimously, all studies show that, um, show that bicuspid aortic valves, they do better compared to the tri-leaflet valve. So certain patients can get TAVR, but certain patients probably should get surgery in this bicuspid aortic valves. Uh, one more example, um, the median age of the TAVR has been decreasing over time. Now it's about 75 years. And unfortunately, these TAVR valves, the bioprosthetic valves, they fail over time. About 10 to 12 years, those valves calcify or they tear and they just don't work anymore. So when you put these valves, there's this new concept called lifetime management of aortic stenosis, which has been my, um, my area of fo focus of research um, lately. And if you put TAVR on 80-year-olds, they're going to complete their life cycle. But if you have a 65-year-old, and if they're going to live 15, 20 years, then if they get TAVR the first time, you will need a second procedure. If you're 50, you may even need two procedures. And when you have these interventions, um, there is a risk. Um, these are two of my cases where I had to take out a TAVR valve, one for an infection and one for uh, structural valve deterioration, more for the leakage. So what are the outcomes when you take out a TAVR on a patient who received that in the first place? Um, this was presented at a meeting called the TVT. And again, we looked at the, um, the claims data. Uh, we came up with 227 patients. This was relatively an early study. Um, this is now considered one of the landmark study in this TAVR explant. Um, relatively small series, but um, you know, one of the first that got reported. And the age groups were actually relatively young. These were 70s, um, patients in the 70s. And some of the complication risks were relatively low compared to patients who did not get explantation, meaning that there was some selection that went into this. And the most striking part of this was that the 30-day mortality was 13%. So 
the mortality of surgery nowadays is 1% to 2%. If you have any higher percentage, you get scrutinized. So mortality of 13% means that more than 10% of the patients are dying. This was actually very, very significant. And if you actually get the TAVR explant, um, these patients did, didn't do well um, in a long term. So if that TAVR valve fails, can you put another TAVR valve inside of it? Um, just like here, you see the old TAVR valve and you put another one inside. It's like a Russian doll. You can keep putting it inside. Um, there's been a report, um, the Landis group uh, from Vancouver reported at first, they reported that the mortality was 1%. But when we looked at it with the claims data, the mortality was actually much, much higher. Um, it was about 6%, still better than the TAVR explant. So, you know, some of, these, some of these nuances of these treatments, although there's a lot of selection bias, uh, was one of the things that we reported. Um, and we also saw that when you actually have a repeat TAVR, their long-term survival was not really good. Maybe these are selection bias, but there's more to come in the next decade or two. I think there, this is going to be a very, very prominent problem with the number of TAVRs being implanted. So this is the guidelines that the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association, Association publishes. This is the guideline on aortic stenosis. I don't know if any of you can read any of the letters here. Um, it is that complicated. And you really need a heart team that puts the patient care first with their expertise and come up with all these updated data and updated knowledge about, uh, about this field. However, this heart team concept is currently in jeopardy. So there was a European guidelines that was published about three years ago, and some of the surgeons said, I don't agree with this. And they actually bailed out, they actually stopped endorsing the, um, that particular guidelines. Um, the surgical community calls, is called EACS. And there was a similar thing that recently happened in the United States as well. And this was an actual statement made from the uh, European Cardiothoracic Surgery Society saying that we will withdraw its support from the guidelines. And there was a disagreement in one of the interpretation of the clinical study. How about the valve team concept? This is a paper that was published two years ago from the team in, um, in Ontario. They looked at the valve team utilization in Ontario, which has been steadily declining. What was even more concerning was that the yellow line on the, on the right side of the graph is the volume of TAVRs being performed in each of the centers. So the top three centers in Ontario stopped using the valve team. So why is that? Why, why are we not using this valve team? I told you that it's fantastic, right? But in reality, it's inefficient. You know, you have to talk to the patient twice and you have to agree with your colleague and you have to make a communication. It's extra step for you. And you need mutual respect. You have to respect the others for this heart team to work. If you think that they're just there for a reason, it's just, it's just, just not going to work. There's always going to be a politics within the team. And then in some cases, patient care may come second after individual interest. In addition to that, we all have different backgrounds. Um, you know, these are the people who consist the heart team and cardiac surgeons, anesthesiologists, cardiologists, I'm not naming everybody here, but they have different pathway, different training, and then they come to the valve team. It's even more so with the nurses, APPs, and the admins. Um, they have different education background, and they come, to the, they come to the valve team. But we have to remember, these are all imagined orders. Uh, we created this. We, you know, we created that these are cardiologists and these are cardiac surgeons. We are all same human beings. We're trying to care for the patient. We have different backgrounds. So how can you make the team function? Uh, this is sort of the historical book on the five dysfunctions of the team. And it talks about the five steps, how the team becomes dysfunctional. It's actually a very interesting book. But in the bottom, in the bottom at the base, it, there's absence of trust. And you have to create that trust to make this heart team function. So how do you make that function? Number one is the proper training. Um, you have to have a role in the team. So this is Michael Davidson, um, who was my mentor during my Brigham days. Um, those of you who might know, he tragically got shot and he actually passed away first year in my practice. Um, I wrote this um, editorial um, after getting approval from Dr. Patterson at the time. He was the editor for Annals of Thoracic Surgery. And um, we spoke about um, the visionary of cross-training. Um, without him, I would not be here. I think Mike would be very proud of me um, standing here and um, I would not be here without um, his vision. Um, I'm just carrying on his vision here. 
but he thought that cross-training in the cardiology field really created that unity uh, with proper training and proper respect from the other side of the team. So this is something that I've been trying to endorse, um, making sure that uh, people get adequate training to be in that part of the team. Also, the structures do matter too. Um, this is simplifying the heart team, but if you have two members from two parties, um, this is all the combos that you get. If you have six members, this is the combination that you get. There's a lot of combo. But if you have two and you mainly work with the other person, then that becomes a stronger tie. That becomes a trust. We also have to share a goal. You don't want to be looking like this. You're not going to move forward, unfortunately. You want to make sure that you look at the goal. You have to communicate, and you have to make sure that people come with the respect. You can see that you know, there's always someone that will not follow you, unfortunately. So you got to communicate and make sure. And you know, also, the, setting the goal is also imagined orders. We're supposed to be very, very good at this. And once we set that goal, we should be able to achieve that as a team. Number four is that we have to be innovators. Uh, there are inventions, there are innovations, a lot of things that you can do that will really lead to the contribution as well as the respect among the team. Uh, this is another transcatheter device. I didn't get a time to talk about this called a mitro clip. And the actual picture on the left is the IP for the, uh, the mitro clip device itself. Guess who wrote this IP? There was about three people that wrote it, but one of them is probably the world's most famous cardiac surgeon um, that everybody in this audience would know, which is Dr. Oz. <laughs> you know, one of the things that I did um, back at the Brigham, um, you know, this is not innovation like what MitroClip was, but this was a 37-year-old patient who came in. Um, she had a tissue valve um, at the age 25, and she came back because the valve failed, but uh, she wanted to be pregnant again. So she did not want a mechanical valve. And we tried to look for a TAVR option, but on the left lower corner, that shows that some of the arteries are too close to do the TAVR. And she really wanted to be pregnant, so what I ended up doing was I replaced the whole route with this graft called the Valsalva graft. Valsalva graft is nothing new, um, but I did the whole route. And after doing that, um, you know, she now has an anatomy that will allow her to get a second TAVR when this valve fails. And she fortunately got pregnant after this surgery. So I think these are minor innovations, but these are the innovations that really can make a difference for every single patient. And I cannot emphasize the importance of skin in the game. This is a little bit of a complex concept, but another great philosopher, Dr. Uh, Talib, um, you know, people say that he's not the nicest person in the world, but his, his, his books are brilliant. And he talks about skin in the game. Skin in the game means that it means that you do not pay attention to what people say, only to what they do and how much of their neck they are putting online. So what does that mean when you put it on the heart team? So surgeons, by not being involved in the heart team, can criticize transcatheter technology because they have no skin in the game. But if you have surgeons that are involved in the heart team, they can assess the technology critically because they have skin in the game. Vice versa, if you have interventional cardiologists who's involved in the heart team discussion, it's less likely to criticize surgery. I see a couple of the interventional cardiologists over there. So you know they probably won't criticize surgery as much. So the members of the heart team must have skin in the game to make the best decision for the patient, patient care. And we all have to have a skin in the game in order to create that functional heart team. But most importantly, teamwork brings happiness. This is from the uh, Harvard Business Review. Um, Dr. Eberlein can attest, anything from Harvard, we have to believe. Um, <laughs> the, the more you go to the right in this chart, it means that there is more teamwork. And the grading system on the bottom shows how happy you are. And throughout, you don't, you don't, it doesn't matter where you live. Um, you know, if you have more teamwork, you have more happiness in your life. And that's what we aim for, right? So I sort of focused today on the valve team today. Um, you know, this is sort of the picture of the valve team. It involves the cardiac surgeon, interventional cardiologist, the coordinators, um, and many, many others. But I think the heart team interpretation should not just be the valve team. Um, it should be the, all the physicians, surgeons, cardiologists, anesthesiologists, intensivists, radiologists. There are multiple other physicians that gets involved that I cannot list here. Healthcare providers, the APPs, nurses, technicians, social workers, case managers, and of course, the wonderful office staff and the administrators. They're all our heart team, and we have to create that. So this is my vision of the heart team. 
This is what we should look like. We should share the goal, communicate, and then mutual trust. Thank you very much for this honor, and I really appreciate everybody for being here. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Wow. Siyoshi Kaneko, the best example of a Holiday Inn, Holiday Inn Express phenomenon I think I've ever seen. Social scientist, anthropologist, historian before 6 a.m. while working out. Uh, and then he goes to work to be an inno innovator in cardiac surgery. So we are really honored to have you uh, serve as the next John M. Schoenberg Chair in Cardiovascular Disease. I want to thank all our esteemed guests and the Schoenberg family for being here. Um, and uh, I would like to invite you all for a little light refreshments to continue the celebration this evening. Thank you very thank much. You. We want to get the pictures of the family here. Or? I'll Maybe take a, a picture. couple of quick family pictures. Yeah, and the Schoenberg family, maybe we could join us for a minute. <laughs> Yes, I think that was